interpret your, your talk with it. And of course, it's important to, to all of us one way or the other. But if they say, for example, I, I mean, I'll give you many texts if you want, but if they say, 1 Peter 1 says, because of the resurrection of Jesus, heaven has been attained. You cannot take heaven away from us. And I'm sure about it. He said, you can rejoice with this, Peter talking. I'm sure of this. You can rejoice with this with, with, a, uh, with the greatest of joy. He says, effervescent, flowing over joy. I'm just saying, there's no, resur there's no Christianity without a resurrection. You pull, Christi you pull the resurrection out, there's no Christianity. So to say they weren't willing to die for a resurrection, I think is to to greatly misplace the, uh, the data. I, I think that if they died for it, you'd have to at least concede their sincerity. Once again, if you show one person in history, three, you know, there's almost no one in history who's willingly died for what they know to be a lie, unless the person has mental issues. But we die for things, if you willingly die, you, you mentally die, sorry, you willingly die for things that you believe to be. That is a witness, since they were in position to know of what they saw, was real or not. Okay, well one thing I would say is that there is no doubt some question over the mental issues of the people in question. We've got no, no clear evidence that they were entirely, entirely sane. The second point is that whilst it may be true that whilst it may be true that all Christians today believe in resurrection, it seems to be the case that there were Christians and you may say you can't be a Christian without believing in the resurrection, as St. Paul did, but there certainly were people who believed themselves to be followers of Jesus who did not or believe in or at least doubted what do you have, um, what do you have in mind the resurrection. Well, why was he writing to Corinth? Who were the people in Corinth he was writing to? Well, because he, he took the gospel to a non-Jewish, non-Christian, obviously, center, a, a, a strong point of, I mean, a, a center where Greek philosophy is being taught. These are very young believers he simply, as a professor who's challenging his students, he's saying, hey, I was your birth father. I was the one that came here with the gospel, and that's what I was arguing here. And, and you guys have got it all wrong. You weren't listening to me, or you got it, you got it mixed up, or you're doing this. The book of 1 Corinthians is caught up with a whole bunch of things. They were, they were coming to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and they were coming drunk. And he said, you know, you really ought not to come drunk. That's not really it. So just to say, because he was correcting them, Therefore, some early Christians must have believed. I'm talking, this is about the earliest witnesses, not people who weren't witnesses, not people who were 20 years later, the earliest eyewitnesses who later were willing to die. That's the people I'm talking about, not Corinthians who were in a Greek culture who got it wrong, who were corrected by their master. Okay, so the, all we've established at best is that, we'll, well, at least I'm happy to see that you can see that there were Christians who didn't believe in resurrection, at least at that time. The second point is that, no, the second point is that all that's been established is on the one hand that St. Paul proclaimed the resurrection and on the other hand that St. Paul died. We still haven't got a reason as far as I can see for specifically saying that all of these, these people died for the resurrection. The third point is that we are now seem to be getting quite far from the question at hand, which is whether there's compelling evidence as to whether A, corpses reanimate in three days and B, are able to pass through rock. Okay. okay. If we could just, uh, we have uh, five minutes left. So, um, Professor Haugnas, if you have one final question um, and then... The other Thank way. you. Yes. Okay. I'm not. Meant, I, I'm not. Okay. Okay. You want me to just state a question, right? Not answer um, sure. his previous. Um, if you want to answer that briefly, and then we just need to wrap up, Steve. Okay. All right. I'll tell you what. I'll just. I'll just pass on my my comment. A question to you. I, I've asked a couple times now. Under what conditions would you say, if this, if this obtained? Now, I, you know, no, in fairness to you, you don't believe these things. But if this happened, I'd be more open to resurrection. If this happened, I'd be more open to resurrection. If this happened, I'd be more open to resurrection. Um, for example, good data in the New Testament. For example, if your death experience is obtained. For example, I'm an atheist, but if there were a God, I could see passing through a rock as, what would it take for you to say, wow, mm, I'm not there, but if I were, I'd be a little more open to considering this. I suppose what it would take for me is the same as the sort of thing that it would have taken for Hume to believe in a miracle. I didn't actually use the word miracle until now. It certainly played no role in my argument. No, that's but, okay. but Hume, in his essay, did consider a case which would believe. He imagined the case of eight days of darkness over the earth, and he said that he would believe that it had actually happened if scholars from all countries of all levels of education, or at least of very high levels of education, who were sceptical who had nothing to gain from proclaiming that particular message, 
um, all uh, uttered it, and perhaps also if there was some natural evidence that it had occurred. Now, something evidence as strong as that might be something like what would get me to believe that a, that a dead body can reanimate after three days. The kind of thing you would want would be something like, I mean, today it would have to be something that was done in a very prestigious laboratory with video cameras filming it all the time, dozens of people who had no interest in, no particular, nothing to gain from the result being one way or the other, making sworn testimonies. That would be the kind of thing that you would want. Okay. Concerning resurrection, I don't mean Con darkness. I mean resurrection. Concerning, concerning bodily reanimation, something like that might be might be evidence, yeah. Okay, might and be. Dr. Ahmed, if you want one final question, Professor uh, Yes, thanks very much. I'd like actually to take the opportunity to, to respond to a point that, um, that Gary made that I haven't yet had the chance to discuss, which is that he mentioned, he mentioned Hume, and in that context he mentioned uh, Mavrodis' objection to Hume. The objection, as far as I could understand it, seemed to be that Hume assumes, uh, my argument isn't Hume's, by the way, or if it is, that resemblance is, is only accidental, though obviously it bears some resemblance to Hume's. The argument against Hume was that Hume assumes that we have uniform testimony against miracles, but of course that assumption begs the question, because, um, because you could only know that we have uniform testimony against miracles if, um, uh, if you know that all testimony uh, in, favor, sorry, in favor of miracles is false. Now, I nowhere assume that. I nowhere assume that we have uniform testimony in favor, uh, against miracles. Um, all I assume that we, that we have ev uh, extensive evidence against physical bodies passing through rock and corpses coming back to life in three days. I don't think anybody would doubt that. Um, it seems to me, therefore, that it's not entirely clear what's wrong, um, what's wrong with the first argument. Perhaps Gary could just wrap up by telling me the first argument, the second argument, and the third argument. If the premises are true, the conclusion is also true in all three cases. So perhaps Gary could just summarize, it would be a useful way to summarize his position if he could tell us which of the premises in those three arguments he denies. Yes, l let, me, let me come about Hewitt directly. And yes, I, can, I will just say, I'm not accusing you of having used Hume, but Hume is behind a lot of this contemporary antecedent probability, so I started there and I made some comments. Hume also says, just before the end of part one of his famous essay, he says this, he says, it would be a miracle if a dead man should rise from the dead, for it has never been observed at any time. And he has no explanation, he goes right on. I, I think one of the things that I'm concerned about with those kind of observations is the and I'm not saying you're doing this at all, seriously. But I prioritize objections that say, well, look, uh, I need some good evidence. Oh, there's some things here. Well, sorry, I'm not going to admit it no matter what. And I, I, don't, I don't say he's saying that. I'm just saying that's the same thing that comes out of this essay from Hume. Nothing amounts because there's a uniform case. Now, as far as what I would do in each case on these, on these um, arguments of Dr. Ahmed's, the three arguments, I would just say, what, what I was trying to say over here when I first started was that different things obtain to change the argument. For example, I specifically responded to your third argument, that one I took by itself. I specifically responded to uh, hallucinations, and somebody could say, well, group hallucinations. I'm, I'm not sure if you folks got my point. Sometimes, nat it's very hard to explain. Sometimes naturalists say, well, there are no such things as group hallucinations. But um, then again, there are no such things as resurrections. So I'll take group hallucinations. And I'm saying it's not group hallucination versus resurrection. It's group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination. Now what's looking better when they're not seen anywhere else? So I did respond to number three already. But I'm saying under first and the second one, I'm just saying different things can obtain in the universe that would entirely upset the apple cart. So for example, um, number four in the first argument, therefore it's more likely that the witnesses got it wrong. Well, witnesses can get things wrong. But for example, if God existed, I'm just posing these ifs in here, if God existed, God could take a body through rock and a witness could be right. If you want to make number four, if you want to press that to the nth degree, it's like we never have evidence for these things. And then incredible one-time events, like say a Big Bang, would never be evidence. We would never be able to prove a Big Bang, for example. Never, because it's a one-time event. Uh, we just don't have evidences. So I'm just saying many things can obtain. I, I suggested two, God's existence, near-death experiences. And all of a sudden someone says, ah, well that does change the picture. So I do think these can be trumped, but I specifically responded to that last one, and then I gave the other points to the first two. Okay, well I thank both of our speakers very much, and pausing only to try and get my head around the concept of an eyewitness testimony for the